Hello, and welcome to Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Let's take a second to reflect. When was the last time you heard a positive headline about our oceans? We seem to be constantly bombarded with doom and gloom news. Another oil spill happened off the coast of somewhere awesome and is killing wildlife. Shark numbers are in steep decline and entire ecosystems have collapsed. Microplastics have reached the most remote parts of the ocean. The list goes on and on and on. Eventually, the constant negativity begins to weigh on us and our guilt becomes so strong that sushi date night becomes less appealing. You think to yourself, am I contributing to the problem? Where did this fish come from? Is there a way for me to use my buying power to protect our blue planet? Yes, my good friend, there is. And it entails supporting sustainable fisheries. How do you go about that, you ask? Well, luckily, you are about to find out. Today, I'm chatting with Tiare Boys. Tiare is a commercial fisherman, professional diver, underwater filmmaker, and artist. Tiare grew up on the coast of Vancouver, British Columbia in a fishing family, and I promise you that few people outside of her field understand ethical fishing better than she does. She's been on the water pretty much since the day she was born. We dive deep, no pun intended, into her story, her love of underwater filmmaking and photography, gender gaps in the fishing industry, how she uses art to spread ocean conservation awareness, and what we all can do to help our seas. All right, everyone, I won't keep you waiting any longer. Here is my conversation with Tiare. Well, hi, Tiare. Thank you so much for coming on Rewildology today and spending some of your afternoon on one of the days you're not in the water to come chat and hang out with me. So very excited to get into your story here. But before we get to what you're doing now and what your current career is and everything that's currently going on in the area that you live, let's go back. Tell me about your childhood and what really planted the seeds of what you're doing now. Well, thanks for having me, Brooke. It's great to chat with you. I'm a big fan of your podcast, so thanks for having me out here. Um, yeah, I mean, from a very early age, my father, he started fishing to put himself through his master's. He did a master's in marine biology and in order to pay for his way through school, he would go fishing in the summertime. And that's how he met my mom. And then, you know, I came along a few years later. And so <laughs> the ocean has always been a huge part of my life. You know, I grew up on the dock um, with the rest of the, the fishing community kids. We'd run around and build forts and, and look at all the life hanging off the pilings. And we had our own little boat. And so I learned how to sail from an early age and row my little dinghy around the harbor. So it, it really was a fascination that, that I can't pinpoint a time because I was... I think quite literally made at sea. <laughs> uh, parents, I should I should ask them. <laughs> yeah, you're like, so do you remember when I was conceived? And yeah. um yeah, was I like literally in the ocean? Is that how that happened? <laughs> <laughs> they might say yes. That's actually a really fun <laughs> question. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, that's so fun. That's so fun. So it sounds like from a very young age, you've been on the water. That's just what your thing is. But also just for those listening, where, what water are we talking about? Yeah. So I grew up on Vancouver Island, which is quite a large island off the West coast of Canada. So we're sort of in the North Pacific area. People call it the Pacific Northwest, but when you're talking about the ocean, it's actually the Pacific Northeast of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> So in that geography. Area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's great. That's great. So, so you were, you had this love of the ocean from a very a young age, um, from day one, then what did you do after that? So it sounds like you were always on the boat that then did you go to college to study marine type things or what was your journey after that? Yeah, from an early age, I was always just fascinated with what was going on in the water, and I was never satiated just looking at it from the top. So when I was 12 years old, I uh, got my my diving certificate, and when I was 16, I was that cool kid who went marine to marine biology camp, where we um, also did a lot of scuba diving courses, and we conduct experiments uh, with with marine life and and looking at the specimens both in their natural habitat, but also in our lab at Pearson College. 
And I went on to university, studied environmental studies. I always wanted to look in at, at the, the ocean side of things, but I could never find a program at the school I was at that um, built into that. So when I finished my undergraduate degree, I got a job working as a dive master on a liveaboard dive boat that worked up in Alaska. Wow. And that was just the best thing. Yeah, that I got to so be underwater. <laughs> It was incredible. And, mm -hmm. you know, the people I met and, and the fish that I met as well, um, it, it really just it fueled that that fire and that passion I have for marine life. And so when I when it came time for me to do my master's, I, I did a focus on marine and coastal management and I wanted to look into fisheries. And so I wrote my thesis, my thesis with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans of Canada, which is kind of like the NOAA for the United States, it's the Canadian NOAA. And I, I worked with the Groundfish Division, and I moved to Iceland to do my coursework for my master's degree. And that was really cool because I got to be introduced to all these Atlantic cold water species, which are in some cases similar, in some cases vastly different. And uh, yeah, it was lots of, lots of new fish to learn about. So then let's chat for a second here. And I think that because when you and I were chatting the other day, there's a, there's a point you brought up that I would love to explore right here because I, I had a similar thing where for some reason, I don't know if it's in the field or what, what you went through, but we feel like we need to continue our education because from what I understand now, you're pretty much doing what you were doing before pre-masters. But for some reason, like, I mean, I went through the exact same thing. I felt this need where I had to keep going. I had to get more letters behind my name. I had to keep going with more credentials. So, so why do you feel like you needed to go on and pursue your master's? I think that is a huge question. It's, it's very large. And I think um, for every person you ask, they have a different answer to it. For me, I was, you know, working as a dive master and working as a commercial fisherman. And I thought the only way that I could get sort of an office job or or what I considered at that time a real job um, was to pursue higher education. Because I think in a lot of cases, especially if you want to work in our case for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans um, or in any sort of marine biology context, you need to have a, a master's degree, not just an undergraduate degree. And um, and I thought that was the way I wanted to go. And I also, I really wanted to make uh, a difference. I wanted to be useful in this world. Uh, I think that there's a lot of things that we need to do better. And one of them is sustainable fishing. And so I thought that was my calling. I, I thought I'd go into that and, and really make a difference in food security and youth and women as fish harvesters. And, and I went down that 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 path and I, I, I worked on international committees and worked with some incredible people all around the world and they're just so passionate and, and there's a lot of innovation going on, a lot of, a lot of incredible women in this area where a lot of people don't see a lot of representation. Um, but after three years of running my own consulting company and, and doing a lot of this work, I just felt so drawn back to the ocean to be in the water, to be, to be working on the water and while it is so incredibly important for people to be working in policy, um, international, but also national and um, local levels. That's not my road, I found out. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really grateful that I that I I tried that out and and I met all the people I did. But I'm very happy uh, being out on the water, being under the water, and and working for what I think is is what is my calling. Mm. Yeah, it's like your your life has come full circle from what you're doing as a little girl, and you're like, I'm back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and what I, are I you doing now? Well, right now, I I work in the film industry, so I, I work um, with underwater filmmaking. I am a marine debris artist, so I take uh, marine debris that is washed up on beaches and is cleaned up as a part of beach cleanups, and I turn it into art. So, a lot of this debris is from the fishing industry. And I always want to make sure that people understand that while the fishing industry does contribute to um, marine plastics, it's not the only source of marine plastics. As we all know, there's plastic bags and bottles and, and we all contribute as individuals, but I, I can't paint on plastic bags. So I paint mostly on fishing buoys and I 
I paint them with marine scenes and, and local animals um, that you can find in the waters here off Anchor Island. I use all of my own photography. I'm an underwater photographer. So I use that as my, my reference photos and 10% of all my sales go to a local marine charity. So sometimes Pacific Salmon Foundation, um, sometimes in the Euclid Aquarium's Marine Debris Research Program. And there's just, there's so many local programs. I'm sure you have many in your area, maybe not so much ocean themed, but ah, <laughs> we're a little far away. We're like as far as away as you could possibly <laughs> be from the ocean where I am. <laughs> yeah. And then I work as a dive guide and um, I'm a commercial diver as well. So I, I'm a freelance ocean mariner person. <laughs> <laughs> that is the coolest title. Thank you. <laughs> freelance mariner. There is a million ways that we could go after yeah. everything you just said. And I just wrote down at least four points that I would love to explore further with everything that you've just said and experienced and clearly have a ton of knowledge on. But I think one of the first things that I would really love to discuss, because this might not be something that a lot of people in the field really think about, especially from a, like a water marine standpoint, and that is the role of gender in all of this. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I know that you and I were talking about like growing up, like you really didn't see that there could be gender differences until you started to branch out from where you grew up. And so what have you seen over the years? And it sounds like you did it more on an international consulting type thing. So I would love like teach us what is up with gender and these and water and marine stuff. Well, I think, I think in a lot of it, traditionally male dominated roles like the fishing industry, there is underrepresentation of women and, and other groups of people. Broadly, um, the community I grew up in, that wasn't uh, what I saw. So my mother was a fisherman. All the fishing kids had summer jobs on the fishing boats, regardless of their gender. Um, I've been working with the same crew. They're in their 60s now. Um, <laughs> 50s, 40s, and 60s. And I've been working with the same crew for the last 19 years. I've been a commercial fisherman for 19 years. And I have always felt, and I continue to feel that they judge me not based on my gender, but based on how hard I work. And I, I, I know I've been really lucky with that. I, I know that's not the experience of every woman. And I, I do acknowledge that I've been extremely privileged. I've grown up in a community where gender wasn't a prohibiting factor for whatever we wanted to try. And I, and I know that that isn't the case everywhere. And there is uh, some spaces in the fishing industry that aren't always safe for women. But fortunately for me, I have never had those experiences. So I want to acknowledge that, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, I think, as we all know, that could be better. And I started off going to the Committee on World Food Security as a representative of my family's small fishing company. So it's my dad, my cousin, and I. Um, we have, my dad has one boat, and and it's been the same crew for, you know, over 30 years. And, uh, and I showed up at the Committee on World Food Security, and um, I was one of two people on the private sector mechanism who actually harvested food with their own hands, and I was the only girl. Um, wow. The other person was a as a, a guy from Australia who was another fish harvester and, and he he got me excited to go there. And but then I went for three years, and by the end of the three years, there was 74 youth from the farming community and uh, equal representation of, of men and women and um, young people from all over the world, Africa, Asia, everywhere. And and that was really cool just to hear all these stories of all these people um, working in the harvest, harvesting sector. Uh, but I was still the only young female fish harvester um, <laughs> at this. So I'd love to see, I know they're out there, um, but sometimes it is difficult to balance working as an active commercial fish harvester and being engaged politically on you know, local, national and, and international levels because you know we're, we're out there, we're, we're working, so. Sometimes it's it's a little difficult to see those women who are out there. And and I know there is significantly less women working in the primary production in the seafood harvesting sector. There's a lot more who work in the secondary production. So um, working with the 
processing of seafood and things like that. So women do have a strong role to play in seafood harvesting around the world. So if, if I understand correctly, so primary meaning the people who are actually on the boat pulling the fish out of the water and secondary people at the docks, essentially yeah, taking yeah. in and then selling that product or, or something like this. So is that more, okay. Yes, making yeah. sure I interpreted that correctly. So how then do we engage women? I mean, if you're in three years, you went to this conference, you know, that many times saw a significant increase in youth that were represented politically as, you know, sustainable food harvesting, but you were still the only woman fish harvester. So how do we, how, how, how do we change that? How do we get more women represented at big decision-making things like that? That is an excellent question. And that is the question that everybody's asking. And I get asked that all the time, which I think is so cool because there's a lot of people out there who want to engage more. Uh, with this sector that's largely unseen. And I think it's it's getting much, much better, especially with the um, social media tools and things like that. There's some really neat people out there who who are, are are working to connect with these sectors around the world. But I think we just need to we need to connect as humans and and reach up to our networks and just ex expand, you know, who we are connected with. It's it's difficult, but I think once once you start knitting that sweater, you, you just have the same loop that keeps going and going and going and eventually you get to the end of your, your pattern and you have this beautiful <laughs> network of, of people to draw on. So I'm working on that. I don't have a, an answer. Um, <laughs> I'm working on it. Good. No, that, that's exciting. That's exciting. And so, so the, next, the next little point here that I wrote down was sustainable fishing. So to you and your many years of knowledge, what exactly does that mean for us on our end? And also too, I would really love if you could maybe also give us pointers on how to look for it as well. Both things. Yeah. Um, well, I think A, uh, sustainable fishing is possible. We need peer-reviewed science. We need funding for science on a you know a local level on a national level and that that's a problem for many governments around the world is making sure that we have peer-reviewed science collecting the data making sure that it's independent so that's that's the first step in having a sustainable fishery and accurately trying understanding what's going on and then enforcement of or Regulations that reflect the, the state of the population, of, of the fish population, the harvest regulations, and then enforceable regulations. So things like at-sea monitoring, uh, there's a variety of ways. And I, I want people to know that there's no one fix-all for every fishery because every fishery is completely different. And what might work in one won't work in the other. So we need to engage fish harvesters in, in trying to make our fisheries better every year. And just because, you know, you, you have achieved milestones in, in the sustainable fishing pursuit, it doesn't mean that you don't have more work to do. So we should never rest on our laurels. We can always do better. And uh, one of the, a good way of people supporting sustainable fishing is, is to reach out to your local fish harvesters, get to know what's going on in the community. I know it's really confusing because there's so many different types of fishing and for each species. And sometimes the species over here is sustainable, but not over here. And what is long lining versus um, purse staining versus, you know, and I just really encourage people not to paint fisheries with the same brush because it's so complex just learning a little bit more. But if you don't have time for that, then there's lots of organizations like the Marine Stewardship Council and, and other uh, sustainable seafood certifying bodies. So what they do is they do the research. They are 100% uh, independent and they, they look for things like environmental impacts, um, bycatch, uh, enforceability, regulations, data collection, even down to how the fishermen are being treated. So labor standards as well are an important part of that. So you can just go to the grocery store look for that little blue fish label or, or go to your restaurant. And, and that's a very easy way. I do that as well. So I catch a lot of my own fish or I get fish from people I know. And so I know it's from a sustainable source, but for things that I've never tried before, I can go to the grocery store and, and just look for one of these labels and I can try new flavors, but also know that it's not coming from a place where the environment or the cost is being taken out of the environment. I, I'm, I'm paying for this 
I want the cost to come out of my wallet, not out of the health of the environment. Oh, that's a great quote. Yes. And I love, I love that you brought up the, these like independent certifying bodies because those are huge. And that's pretty much all that we as consumers have to rely on anymore. I mean, I love sushi, you know, I love different types of fish as well, but I'm, I'm in Colorado, Rocky Mountain, USA. Like I am as far away from an ocean as literally someone can get. And someone like me or someone in a similar situation how in the world do we know, especially with greenwashing labels? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, really sticking to those high, high standards. Like when you see this one label, then you know you're good. Yeah. I completely agree with that one. So that, that one's really good. So next, since you spend so much time in the water and you've, I mean, over the years and you still are every single day, like, again, we just happen to be able to chat today because the weather's not good. And so... <laughs> Thank you, Mother Nature, for giving a bad day so we can sit down. <laughs> but trash, what have you seen over the years? I mean, trash is a massive issue. Yes, there is marine-specific debris, like you said, mm -hmm. um, but there's also so much other stuff. So, like, what have you seen over the years? Has it gotten worse? Has it gotten better? Just being under the water all the time, what are your observations? That's a really great question. Um, I know on our coast here, a lot of our marine debris is either local. So a lot of the buoys I find, I can actually trace who they came from because they have markings on them. And, and to be honest, you know, a lot of these buoys could be used again. They aren't necessarily a one-time use, you know, but a lot of people, because they're covered in marine life, they get thrown into the garbage. And so for me, I, I clean them, I turn them into art and recycle them. But it's really neat to be able to track where, where they come from. Um, I know after the tsunami in Japan, because I've been out on the ocean every year for 19 years, we saw so much debris from Japan. And, and we wow. do, yeah, quite a, just because of the way that the ocean gyre works. I'm not singling out Japan. Right, right, right. Literally, it's just how, how our, our oceans um, work. So we, we do see um, debris from Japan. When I lived in Iceland, you see plastics from Russia because that's how the gyres work there. And then when I lived in Costa Rica, a lot of the plastics was coming out of the rivers and coming onto the beach from the rivers. So I think each place, it's, it's very specific. I think as a whole, hopefully people are much more aware of their impact using single-use plastics and where they go. But I want people to know that, you know, that chocolate bar wrapper or straw or whatever, that plastic bag, it sometimes it ends up in the ocean and, and it can be traced back to where it came from. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a brilliant ad campaign here in Canada that says what you throw out speaks of who, who you are. So, you know, your trash says bad things about you. <laughs> they trash, it trash talks you. And yeah, so we, we can trace where all this stuff comes from. And sometimes it's worse, sometimes it's better. Sometimes, you know, with, with climate change and, and all these unseasonal strong weather events, it, it can increase the distribution of plastics into our ocean. I do see a lot of styrofoam. Styrofoam is one mm. thing that just, it sticks around forever. A lot of stuff sinks and, you know, we, we it's out of sight, out of mind, and we'll find it when we are doing our deep water oceanic surveys. But a lot of styrofoam just sticks around and unfortunately it looks quite tasty to a lot of marine species and they ingest it and yeah. <laughs> Do you see that a lot? For example, the the fish that you harvest yourself, do you see traces of trash when you are processing them? We don't. No. Ooh, that's good. Um, we don't see that in our fish. We I'm very lucky to live on the west coast of Canada and we have very relatively clean waters here. Our ocean is one ocean and so when we pollute one side of the ocean it, it pollutes everywhere in it because it's very interconnected but we're very lucky where we are. I know I know that is a case in, in other parts of the world but I, I do see like when I'm diving especially around the cities that I dive around you know you, you see every day like plastic bags things like that and uh, and, and I do see um, things like lines from from boats um, rope and things like that you see underwater so it's it comes from all sources but the only source is humans. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think next, and since again, you've just spent so much time on the water and studying too from like a scientific standpoint, 
as a scientist? I know this is a very loaded question and you can answer it however you want, but what do you think is the biggest conservation issue for marine ecosystems, either locally, well, I would like to score both, locally for your area, since you see it all the time, and then since you've been in so many waters worldwide, on a bigger whole, what do you think is also the biggest issue that we're facing? I think, uh, again, I'm not a climate scientist and I'm not an expert in any of this, just to preface this, uh, but climate change. Um, we're seeing dioxin and I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> dioxin and Jason. <laughs> the removal of oxygen from our oceans. And so species are struggling. We're seeing rising temperatures and, and species that are incredibly resilient to things like wave action and high tide and low tide. They, they can't deal with these huge temperature fluctuations. Um, we're seeing viruses that, that are decimating local populations here on Vancouver Island. We had a very uh, prevalent species called the sunflower sea star and, and they just ate everything. And a, a virus has almost wiped them out. They're, they're on the, on our endangered list now. Um, and it, it might seem very simple, like, you know, oh, what are sea stars going to have an impact on, but it, they have cascading effects. And so I would say humans are the biggest problem <laughs> and, and, and how we're affecting our blue planet. It's, <laughs> it's not simple. Everybody wants, you know, this is the problem and here's the solution. Right. Um, I, I don't, I don't think we can boil it down to a smoking gun other than the fact that humans are <laughs> the smoking gun and we need to do better. Yeah, completely agree. And I just, I just had this thought that just hit me right now. And I'm sure others too, if they've seen like BBC documentaries or anything like that, that there's now, um, with how much unsustainable fishing there has been worldwide, there's been niches removed or very important levels of ecosystems taken out and that a lot of jellies and other species are starting to fill those niches and it's starting to become a big problem as ecosystems collapse. Have you have you seen that in your studies of like jellyfish populations exploding and then like what happens after that? Is that something that you've witnessed yourself or have just seen on David Attenborough like me? <laughs> and and to be honest, I haven't read any research papers about seeing prevalence of, of jellyfish in I, I I don't know anything about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but I but I can say, you know, there, there's localized events. So sometimes an area where I dive quite frequently, Browning Pass, the ocean currents and the wind bring these huge aggregations of jellyfish together. In fact, they're called aggregating jellies. And it can feel like you're swimming through jello. It, it's just, it's incredible. And, and that's localized conditions. And that, that has happened um, for a very long time. It, it, it is a natural phenomenon. And in some cases, you know, we used to have a dive up in Alaska called Smudge, where just thousands and thousands and thousands of moon jellyfish would congregate in these small bays. And again, this is this is a completely natural phenomenon, but it creates for a, a very uh, dramatic photo and, and film opportunity. It, it's quite beautiful and it's, it's really neat to experience. They're, they're not, they're stinging jellyfish, but they don't sting humans. So it's really cool to see. Wow. That was my next question. I'm like, how do you go in with like a massive jellyfish and not just get completely obliterated? <laughs> yeah, they, they all have nematocytes. They have stinging cells, but um, it just depends on if it can get through our skin or not. We have actually, I think, um, one of the largest animals in the world, which is a lion's mane jellyfish. Not only are they big around, but their tentacles are so long, they can be longer than a blue whale. So what? Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. We have that species here on our coast and they, they do sting. It's not life threatening as far as I know, um, <laughs> <laughs> they do, they do sting. Uh, but when I'm diving, I'm completely covered in a dry suit. So the only area where I can get stung is really around my mouth here. So sometimes I come out with uh, natural Botox lips because I didn't <laughs> notice I stung the <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> natural. They don't do anything for my fine lines though. So. 
I guess she's gonna have the Kim Kardashian lips, you know, <laughs> go the ocean like that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Yeah, I've definitely had some stings before, and they were not fun at yeah. all. On the Atlantic coast, you know, here in the U.S., I don't know what the jellyfish was, but man, it got me right on the back of the leg, and it freaking oh. stung so bad around the back of the knee. And then when I was in Baja, in the Sea of Cortez. There was a massive tropical storm that came through and just washed a whole bunch of jellies up. And we were, uh, it was one of our last days and we went to go see some sea lions because, you know, they're super fun in the water, right? Yeah. And we had no idea that this big swell, these little tiny jellyfish were in there. Again, no idea what species they were, but I got out of that water so goddamn fast because <laughs> it hurts. I know because you can't see you can't see all these people. like where are they coming from <laughs> literally no idea you just feel them you just feel them I'm like ah and um the wetsuit I was in was one of like the um I, uh, I don't know what they're called like the short ones yeah whatever those are called I don't know what they're called but I was in that one and so you felt it I'm just like yeah. man you suck <laughs> you just, I'm getting back out on the boat we already swam the sea lions I'm over it y'all can stay in the water and then too there was like people that had like all over their face because yeah. we're snorkeling so it's not like we have all that headgear <laughs> oh yeah yeah they can be super painful oh my gosh yeah but then but then it goes away yeah it's not that it was not that big of a deal it just sucked because you just thought you, you just don't even know it's coming <laughs> it's really cool so the the singing cell it's called a nematocyte and it's basically like a, a harpoon it's a hair trigger harpoon and so it automatically goes out when when it brush it up against something but it's the same cells that things like um anemones have and oh. i i don't condone touching marine life but if you've ever gently touched an anemone and it kind of feels like velcro feels a little bit sticky that's the anemone trying to eat you <laughs> <laughs> T- tasting you see if you're edible <laughs> exactly yeah it doesn't hurt us because our, our skin is thick but that's how they they catch their prey it's the same mechanism and then nudibranchs they eat things like hydroids which have these very similar stinging cells and they excrete them out their serrata on their back so they digest these stinging cells and somehow use them as their own defense mechanism which i just think is so cool oh my god that is unbelievable so not only did they kill and digest and eat whatever it was they then took the defense and man that's yeah. That is so cool. I mean, I definitely know a lot about that on a lot of species on land where they will intentionally ingest poisonous things and then use that as their defense themselves. But man, that's like next level. Like that's taking living cells out of something else and using that. Yeah. Without somehow setting them off in their gut. <laughs> yeah. They're, Man, that is so they rank cool. are very metal and they're <laughs> fancy dressers. I see all these posts when they people compare them to, to David Bowie outfits, and I just think that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> oh my god, could you please send me one of those? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just... <definitely. laughs> oh, this... we have oh. these here called the hooded nudibrank, and it's completely transparent nudibrank. Um, and it, it sort of looks like a Venus flytrap, so it uses its head to catch snacks in the water column and they, they have these huge blooms so you'll just see thousands and thousands and thousands of these transparent nudibranchs in a single bay and you'll be swimming through them and you'll come out and you'll smell your dry suit and you smell like to me it smells like watermelon bubble gum some people what? Can, yeah they they emit some sort of chemical and and i don't think we know why but these nudibranchs smell like hubba bubba watermelon <laughs> gum it's crazy. <laughs> Again, don't smell marine life. <laughs> they don't like being in <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is so cool. As um, well, I would imagine someone has, and, may- and maybe you don't know, but I wonder if somebody's done like any sort of like chemical testing to see what that actually is and why it smells that way. Yeah, totally. I wonder. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. Please, if you find anything, definitely let me know. That is unbelievably cool so you just like smell like watermelon yeah i mean life like it's my favorite thing to do is be underwater and just watch all these interactions and the evolution of these 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 animals for these very specific niches and and yeah they're they're super badass i mean 
marine life is so cool. And they're oh. literally our next door neighbor. Not so much for you, but for me, they they live, you know, four streets away from me. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, in, in warm countries, it's very accessible to go out and snorkel. A lot of people snorkel, like your experience in, in Mexico and stuff like that. But people don't think about that in cold water. And it is so cool out there. You know, we've got these incredible kelp forests and it's like... Oh swimming through this forest you know in your own little spaceship and you can go up and down and all around and and all the life that lives in there and so I think if more people had that experience being in the water or seeing you know photos or videos of it they they'd realize that you know what they, they put into the drain literally impacts their next door neighbors mm-hmm. absolutely completely agree and yeah hopefully too because then there's also that talk about sustainable um, ecotourism, especially for around like oceans, Mm -hmm. because that is a really big conversation. And and my background is conservation travel. And again, my knowledge is more based on land travel, land animals, land species. Let's actually get into that for a second. Let's chat about it. I mean, you've been around the world. You've, I'm sure you've seen a lot of good and a lot of bad. What is your take uh, maybe in general or maybe specific examples on just like marine based travel what have you seen in your days um you know i i i don't know the specifics of it i know that there's there's a lot of different solutions in a lot of different places and there's some really cool innovative stuff where people are working with you know local fishermen and and you know local harvesters to to be able to balance food security issues, but sustainable travel and things like that. So I can't speak specifically about it, but I know as a, as a diver, uh, I very much appreciate being able to see things like sharks. It's very important to me that these, these top predators are given space and, and area to thrive and things like that. So uh, I'm always very happy to, to go on vacation and, and you know use my buying power to go to areas where the reefs are thriving. So I know, I know with COVID and things like that. It's been very difficult for ecotourism operators. And a lot of our ecotourism operators, they did beach cleanups this summer. So they accessed grant money and they went out and collected uh, marine debris that was on our beaches. So that was a a really great sort of shift during this unprecedented times. (laughs) Very unprecedented. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and sharks too. I'm really I'm really glad you brought up sharks. Why do you think they are so misunderstood and so persecuted? Uh, I mean, they're scary. <laughs> it's it's scary things that you don't know about. They're not when you know about them, when you when you learn about them, but I, I think that true for for anything in life. I think knowledge and familiarity breeds on, you know, respect and understanding and I always say, you know, if if I find something that's gross or I don't like, then I try and learn more about it because it's usually there's something fascinating about it. Same thing with sharks. We have a species of uh, similar to a lamprey called a hagfish here or a slime eel that produce copious amounts of slime. And that's awesome. Gross and disgusting until I learned more about them and their evolution and, you know, how they can tie themselves in knots and things like that. And so I think People are afraid of what they don't know, but I think, especially with sharks, there's been a huge considered effort to to reach the public and to educate them about these incredible animals. They're, they're not just killing machines. They are incredible species that that are really cool to visit, to, to swim with in, you know, a safe way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's predators everywhere, just really misunderstood. And yeah, just it's just... <laughs> It's just really unfortunate because when you take out a top predator, then the entire ecosystem collapses. We've, we've seen it everywhere. And that's, that same principle is the same if it's underwater or if it's on land. When you remove an apex predator, which sharks are, especially, you know, mm-hmm. it's everything eats everything in the ocean, literally. And yeah. <laughs> when you take out the top dog, then the whole thing can collapse. And we've, we've like really started to see that around the world. And mm-hmm. I'm sure you have to with probably going to a lot of reefs and just the top predator just isn't there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I want, I want um, to highlight that, you know, prevalence of sharks doesn't mean that you can't have adapted sustainable fisheries in an area. Everywhere is, is specific. And, and I don't think 
making our entire ocean into a park or a new take zone is the solution. I think there's area-based conservation efforts that are really important. And you know, some areas should be no go, no take zones, things like that. But I think a lot of people want, again, a simple solution to a very complex problem. And if we are going to uh, feed our planet sustainably, um, in some cases, seafood can be a really good option. I don't think it's the only option. We need to, we need to diversify our nutritional needs, the way that we produce food. But um, I, I think, yeah, there's no one solution. We need to make sure that we are protecting our apex predators and things like that and, and, and lots of species. But I think we can also find ways of working within these respectful boundaries for fish, because all fish should be respected. Um, all marine life, I should say, vertebrates included. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just very recently, I'm sure you've seen it, that with all of, I mean, finally, a great example about the ocean, because we only hear bad, 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 bad. The Great Barrier Reef is dying. All of our sharks are gone. Like these mass dolphin killings. I mean, ugh, so much bad stuff. But very recently, um, like bluefin tuna, they were taken off of the endangered list and they're like on least concern now. And like albacore and, or was it yellowfin? No, it was bluefin. It was definitely bluefin. I posted about it. And, and like that, that just goes to show that things are happening. Things are happening. People are coming together. But yeah, like let's chat about that. What, what things have you seen? What new sustainable harvesting ideas have like come to light recently in fisheries or fishermen worldwide? What are some things that are new that are working or being tried? <laughs> Every day, every day, there's there's new solutions being tried. I always say that, you know, I'm, I'm a fisherman, I'm a commercial fisherman, and I'm an environmentalist, I'm a conservationist, because I don't think we have any other option. In fact, I know there's no other option. Um, if we want to be able to have a world where, you know, we can both dive and, and, and see sharks in their natural habitat, but also eat sustainably, sustainably for seafood, we need, we need to take care of them. <laughs> um, so I think we need to we need to balance all of all of our concerns about the ocean to make sure that that we're not overly impacting you know areas and 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 balancing our approach to this. There's a lot of uh, effort going in right now to monitoring at sea. I know in the fishery that I work in, um, I work in the Wild Pacific Albert fishery. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. We have 100% at sea monitoring, so every single vessel on our coast has two cameras and they automatically run every time we run our gear. So they film everything that we encounter. And it, there's a measuring board on the side of the boat. So we know exactly what species is caught, how big it is. And from that, we can infer age and weight and things like that, um, where it was caught. And, and then we also count the fishermen. We, we count every single fish that comes on board. And then when it's offloaded, it's checked. Those numbers are checked against each other. And if you, if your numbers are incorrect, then they automatically audit your tapes and then they audit them randomly, 10% of them. Um, so you, you can't cheat this system. And then the fishermen decided that um, they wanted traceability. And so every single halibut that, that is landed in British Columbia has a barcode that is put in to its tail so that you can trace exactly what fish was caught by what fisherman and where they were fishing. So, wow. you know, there's lots of innovations like that. Um, we have, we have things called Tory lines, which reduce interactions with seabirds. There's, there's all these different things that so there's a lot of research going on with lights to, to make sure that lights aren't confusing seabirds, which I want to say is not just a problem with the commercial fishing industry. It's any light source that is near the water cruise ships, recreational vessels, transport vessels, lighthouses, people who live on the ocean, seabirds can get very confused with certain spectrums of light. So there's little things like this. And, and again, what works in one fishery might not work in another fishery. So we need to balance the incentives to um, people who work at sea, both the incentive to do better, to, to innovate and, and make their fisheries better every single day, but also enforcement so that, you know, if, if, they're not following through on some of the regulations that that there are punishments for that. So we need we need to balance the the carrot and the stick, so to speak, as Ray Helborn, uh, fishery science 
scientists and they always says in his papers. <laughs> that is awesome. No, that this is a fantastic example. I had no idea that 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 level of accountability is now starting, in, uh, you know, up in your area in British Columbia. That is amazing. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of bad news stories out there in fisheries, and and we need we need to focus on those um, so that we can be better. But there's also a lot of really good news stories, and there's a lot of people who are working very hard out there to make to make fisheries better than than it than it has been. Yeah, and that's why I really wanted to take a moment to discuss that for that exact reason. Because if you if all we're hearing is so much bad, and then the IUCN, like the IUCN, makes a massive announcement that a, a fish that was previously endangered is now least concern, clearly there's a disconnected information. Like you cannot go from that low of population, you know, decimation to being least concerned because you are, the numbers are that healthy now in the ocean. So like, why are we not hearing those stories? You know, all this clickbait, nasty, negative stuff, which again, yes, we need to be in the know. We need to know how bad it is. But at the same time, if it's always bad, 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 then who has the incentive to change their behavior? Be like, yeah. um, well, I mean, they're going to die anyways. I want my freaking sushi. Like, give me my sushi. You know what I mean? So I love to hear that. That's a human trait, though. I think it's very natural to focus on the negative, especially when it comes to um, media sources. You know, there's a lot of people who are competing for airtime and sometimes the most dramatized and the, the most shocking news story gets the airtime. And I'm, I'm not I'm not blaming the media. I'm not blaming anybody. You can. <laughs> I blame humans, you know? <laughs> we you like to blame the media. <laughs> We like to focus on negative things. Um, and there's probably something in our evolution that has made us that way. And it's it's easy to villainize people as well. It, it, you know, people that we don't agree with to, to make ourselves feel better in some cases or to protect the group that we identify with. There's a lot of research that, that has to do with that. There's a great book called Factfulness by Hans Rosling, and it just takes data. And we just, we, you look at the data and then you ask people what their interpretation of the state of the world is. And time after time after time, people have a very pessimistic view and inaccurate view of what the world is. And the truth is the world is a better place today than it was yesterday. And that's that's not to discount the suffering and the horrific things that are going on right now. There's a lot of horrible, horrible things that are going on right now. And just be there's a lot of suffering and and we can do better. We can we can make it a better world. But you know, in terms of education and, and, and women, you know, our equality and things like that, we are getting better. There's some areas where, where we've gone back, you know, the state of the world's uh, food, there are more people are food insecure than ever before. And, and a lot of that is things like unprecedented climate anomalies, conflict around the world. So, First of all, we, we need very good data, we need very good science, and we need to make decisions based off of the data and the science, not based off of our perception of things that are going on in the world, because humans, we're not always good at perceiving the truth of things. We need to do peer-reviewed science and, and long-term studies to be able to make informed decisions, not just out of an emotional response, of course, having an emotional connection to things is, is very, very important. But if we're going to make sustainable decisions, and by that I mean decisions that work into the future, we need to take the time to do the research to implement practical solutions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, girl. Yes. We can mic drop on that. Oh, I. You can only imagine my thoughts on all the lack of science at least happening in the u.s i don't know you know like on governmental levels and all that stuff um <laughs> and we're not gonna hmm? no we don't need to go into that but no, I'm, no, I'm we're not. science is is you know the only perspective that we need to consider you know science is only as good as the scientists and the funding so uh we need to include all all perspectives and things like that but <laughs> it's it's a big part <laughs> yeah yeah, exactly. Facts are facts. There's just 
But it doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter how we think. Facts are facts. If like the data is telling us this and it's very good, then this is the way we should move forward and then reevaluate and then do more and more science from there. But uh, who would think? Just as scientists say that, but you know, it's whatever. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. We are we are good. We are good. Um. So so let's let's keep going down this conversation. I would love to hear more about. The, the one of the really big things that you're doing and that is underwater film what exactly does that entail and and what do you do like what are you filming uh, who are you filming for because you're like my first one of my first videographers let alone underneath the water so what all does that entail and what do you do and what are you recording and can we see it anywhere <laughs> <laughs> I can't actually talk about a lot of the projects I've been involved in because there's a non-disclosure agreements that we sign, but I have been involved with things um, with BBC. You can see me on YouTube if you type in dive with giant Pacific octopus and wolf eels, and I'm your on-screen guide. So it's in 3D and 360. So if you have VR goggles, which I don't, you can look up and down and, and just see so everything. Cool. <laughs> it's so cool. Even if you just have your cell phone, you can move your cell phone around and... Um, yeah, so we're just going on a dive in, in my backyard here. <laughs> that is but, so fun. Yeah, I, I think the BBC has done a lot of great work um, getting out the message about our natural world. And, and, you know, I think movies like My Octopus Teacher and things like that have really instilled curiosity in a lot of people about our oceans. So I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in any of this by any means. I'm, I'm just beginning um, on this road, but there's some incredible people out there who are doing a really good job of telling the story of what's going on in our oceans. And it is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Completely agree. I completely agree. So within all of your dives, is there one story or incident that really sticks out to you that was just really crazy? Well, I think giant Pacific octopus, which is the species of octopus that is very common in our waters off here, they're huge. They're one of the largest known species of octopus. They might be one of the longest lived, although there might be some deep water species that live much longer. So they live four years, which doesn't seem like a lot of time for such an intelligent being. They're incredibly smart. And so any dive where I encounter a, an octopus is incredible. I've, I've had some really cool interactions. I, there's one that, that was hiding behind a rock and, and just looking out at me for 45 minutes. I just what? sat and had a, in my opinion, I had a connection um, with this octopus. They don't have human emotions, of course, but it it certainly was curious. <laughs> I don't know if it thought I was food or a predator, but it, it's, we certainly had, you know, 45 minutes of, of just exploring another being, which is, we have aliens in our ocean and they are the coolest things. <laughs> I love that aliens in our ocean. Yes. I hope that, I hope one day to get dive certified and all that kind of stuff. That would be so fun. But I grew up, yeah, nowhere near the ocean, but now having snorkeled and then just looking at all of your videos and just seeing all this stuff. It's just like a whole other level of nature to go <laughs> explore. And like I've been to Galapagos, I've snorkeled all over Galapagos, but I've never dived there and like to go with like the massive schools of hammerhead sharks and all that stuff. That's so cool. <laughs> that's okay not everybody has to dive that's why we make films <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely making it accessible um so yeah so let, let's just shift back to you for a second and tiare what let's get deep here what would you say in your journey so far has been your biggest struggle Uh, I think myself, um, I think the hardest thing is to know what you want to do. And uh, I think I'm susceptible to what people think of me. And sometimes I listen a little bit too much to what I should do instead of what I'm called to do. Um, so I, I finally feel now that I'm on the right path, I'm working in art and film and I'm diving and I think, yeah, the biggest struggle for me was, was just listening to my inner voice and who was saying the whole time, like, you love the ocean, stay in it. <laughs> so how did that conversation with yourself go? Like, was it a moment that you can recall where you're like, I have to do this, I have to go back to the ocean or, or 
how, how did you get to that conclusion to doing what you're doing now again? <laughs> That's an excellent question. <laughs> I think I, I've always, I've always been very concerned about how, what other people think of me. And that is, that's one of my weaknesses. And one thing I'm, I'm working on is, is listening more to my inner voice than the voices that are put upon me. It's, it's always important, you know, to, to take other people's perspectives into account, but only, you know, your true self and, and you can take advice from people. But I think the moment I realized that I need to shift from what I was doing was, was when I, I, wasn't excited to get out of bed anymore. Um, I was in a meaningful field. I was doing something that I think is was very useful, but I, I wasn't excited to do it. I know there's a lot of language out there, you know, follow your passion and things like that. And it can sometimes seem a little frivolous, but I think one of the hardest things we do in life is figure out what we want to do. And sometimes that can change from day to day. But it's also important to figure out what you don't want to do. <laughs> and that can change from day to day as well. So just giving yourself time and space and grace to listen to yourself, to sit with your decisions and to realize that what you've done in the past is just as important as what you want to do in the future, because it can, it can really shape how you approach things. Yeah, I can completely agree with that. I know that I, I'm not that old and I've had multiple career shifts. That's for sure. <laughs> we don't need to do one thing. I think the time where, you know, we have one profession and, and that's it for the rest of your life. I think um, for some people that's really important, but for other people that you don't need to do that anymore. There's so many different things to try. Like there's so much to do in this world. So don't be afraid to start over again or yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I completely agree with that. I completely agree. I mean, with how much opportunity there is now, and now that lots of more things are accessible and the classic career no longer exists, just like you said, it just doesn't exist anymore. You know, get your corporate job and you work with them for 40 years. Everyone's like, well, this new generation, they move from job to job to job. It's like, well, actually, if let's look at this holistically. It just isn't possible anymore to have a job that long anyways. So find your calling, find whatever it is. If yeah. you need security, then then that's okay. You can yeah. find really secure jobs, but that doesn't mean you can't at least try or dabble or volunteer or something that might be what you're really passionate about. And who knows, you might find a whole new life. Yeah. And don't be afraid, you know, if what works for you one day doesn't work for you the next day, that's not a mistake. It's just, you change. Like, things around you change. My grandmother, she, she always says, I feel sorry for you women of today. You have so many choices. <laughs> she said, in my day, you know, you can, you could be a certain number of things like a teacher, a nurse, a mother, a secretary. And she said, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> but she doesn't. She tells all of her friends how proud she is that her daughter walks on the ocean floor, which I don't walk on the ocean floor. <laughs> 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 that's a really good point oh my gosh that is so cute that she says that she's just like i don't know what i would do with all those decisions <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah oh my gosh because now we just even question if we want to be mothers now like and that used to not even be like a decision that someone would have to make even just like a generation ago so yeah. uh, that's i can see why she thinks that yeah i'm so grateful for the people who's come before us and fought to let us you know have more rights and, and everything we still have a long way to go of course um, but I'm very grateful yeah I think about that all the time if I was like during the women's rights era oh my gosh I would be in jail so many times like I just know I just <laughs> I just know I was like okay I don't know if you know reincarnation is a thing but in a past life I was feisty and there is no way <laughs> <laughs> That's I did rough. well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So what asks, or since you have this floor right now, is there anything that you want to make sure that whoever is listening really takes away from this conversation? I think be curious. Uh, be curious about the life in our oceans. Be curious about 
the impact that your daily choices have on the ocean. Be curious about the fishermen in your community or the seafood that you're buying. Um, be curious about the documentary you've seen because you know there's there's so many different perspectives and life is incredibly complex. There's no easy answers. Nothing is black or white. So just dive into that uncertainty. Be uncomfortable. Be vulnerable and and be curious and keep an open mind. Don't be afraid to change your perspective. Don't hold your beliefs so tightly that they become fragile. The most the strongest way to be is to be interconnected and to be able to adapt to changing circumstances, changing science, all of that. Be curious. <laughs> I love it. That's so oh. Could not agree more with that advice. That is so good. That's such a good ask from everybody. So how can people get a hold of you or check out your beautiful art? Oh my gosh. I mean, everything. How can someone see that if they want to chat, get to know you better? What's the best way for someone to go about that? Um, you can reach out on my Instagram, which is tiare boys at tiare boys. Um, T-I-A-R-E-B-U-O-Y-S. Or my website, which is the same, tiariboys.com. Um, yeah, those are two excellent ways to get a hold of me. I think those are the best ways. <laughs> or if you're around Victoria, BC, and uh, you want to go for a dive, let me know. <laughs> ah, yes, yes, yes. I would love that. Oh, my gosh. I, I, uh, that area is very high on the need to travel to list. So <laughs> excellent. We can't wait to, to take you for a snorkel here. <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful. Awesome, Terry. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I just can't wait to share your story with everybody. <laughs> thanks so much, Brooke. I appreciate your curiosity. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>